Okay, we're back. We're live on a given Wednesday in the morning, and we are joined by Carlos Juarez, Puebla, which is, what, 50 miles east of Mexico City. He's there in the uh, University of the Americas, and we are delighted to have him with us again to talk about an international relations and foreign policy. Let's talk about American foreign policy for a while. We've had dramatic change in it. Um, not to say that it's been great over the, you know, the, the years post-war, but um, it's not great now. And it seems to me, uh, as you pointed out in our discussion a moment ago, that we've gone from um, you know, multilateral relationships to bilateral relationships. And uh, the first question I would put to you as a, a, a student of, of global relations, um, is, is that working? Is, uh, is Trump's uh, notion of bilateral relations working, or is, is it so far not working? Well, you know, I think the short answer quickly is to say that Trump's foreign policy and the U.S. relations with the world are at a really low point, uh, dysfunctional, no clear strategy or policy. Um, but, you know, if we step back, on one hand, we can speak of really an international system that was crafted after World War II with U.S. leadership. Uh, that basically has come under a lot of change and pressure in the last decade, especially. So it's not something that Trump, you know, out of the blue just arrived and brought, but he certainly accelerated it. Um, on one hand, it, it reflects, uh, you know, the U.S. Is, is operating in a different world, the rise of uh, China, the emerging powers of places like India, even the EU. But uh, what we have in the new president, Donald Trump, is a very maybe a shift in traditional foreign policy in the U.S., even though we alternated from Democrats to Republicans, there was usually a bipartisan consensus on some core foreign policy issues, including, for example, the importance of alliances, the importance of multilateral forums to carry out, you know, a lot of issues. Trump has rejected those, uh, you know, norms, those traditions, and very much what we might call a more transactional focus. He wants to emphasize the bilateral, and, you know, he will point to some successes on one hand, but at the end of the day, the, the deals that he's been making have yet to come to pass, and a lot of it is a lot of uh, blustering. <clears throat> we've seen, we've talked about this before, how his strategy is to sort of almost like a bull in a china shop, go in and sort of menace and bully and, and make a high drama, existential threat, and then finally come back to somehow make a deal that he would say solves the problem or is the best deal ever. The reality is far from that. And wherever we might look, whether it's the Iran crisis, the, uh, the North Korea saga, the re recent uh, relations with Mexico, uh, it's a very uh, impulsive and, uh, you know, even this notion of Twitter diplomacy where even his, his own advisors don't know what, uh, you know, what, what they can explain or defend. Uh, so they're having to learn themselves by uh, the Twitter feed yeah. uh, what his thinking is. <laughs> it's a bit of chaos. It's, it's uncertainty, chaos. and that's frustration because, uh, you know, just like the business community likes to have some sense of where things are going, you know, in diplomacy, too, you want to know, uh, are the things the president says credible? Are they true? You know, a lot of uh, allegations of falsehood that he often repeats so that people begin to question his, uh, uh, you know, his credibility. And, and, and I think we could say that today the U.S. foreign policy is at a low point, uh, a lot of uh, disdain, a lot of frustration. Uh, a lot of concern of, uh, uh, you know, how do you prepare for that? How do you, you know, how do you manage it? And so where are we? We, we you know, we have a uh, very interesting conjecture right now. We have in, in about 10 days the upcoming meeting of the G20, the group of 20. These are the top industrialized and next tier of emerging powers, a meeting in Osaka, Japan for their annual meeting. Uh, normally these multilateral forums, you know, are a way of, you know, voicing uh, solidarity, consensus, you know, uh, trying to get some shared interest. Uh, we, you know, we have yet to see how this will play out because of uh, the trade war with China. You know, will President Bush, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, President Trump, I guess he signaled that he'll be having a sidebar meeting with the president of China. This is, these forums, these multilateral forums often present opportunities for these. Well, as as I recall, Carlos, he, he threatened uh, Xi Jinping. I mean, it's just winning by yeah, intimidation. That's foreign policy for you, winning by intimidation. And we know it yeah. doesn't work, not in the 21st yeah. century, because they, you know, they can see right through him. I'm not sure whether they see him as a, a clown or a bully or a uh, rotating clown and bully, but uh, they don't see him as an equal partner in the negotiation because of the way he plays. You can't do winning by yeah. intimidation in the 21st century. Nobody will buy it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I think yeah. uh, my recollection is that he told Xi Jinping that if Xi Jinping doesn't show up at the G20, he was going to increase the tariffs. 
He was he was it was going to yeah. punish him for not showing up. There's a great uh, you know setup of a meeting that'll really start you off on the right foot. Yeah, it's it's a tariff diplomacy now and Twitter diplomacy. But you know, uh, on, on one hand, I mean, maybe speaking of where I am here in Mexico, obviously Mexico was really brought to its knees in this most recent negotiation. So on one hand. Trump and maybe his uh, allies and supporters will argue that, you know, only through the threat of these tra tra tariff warfares has he gotten action. And, and on one hand, I guess I want to say that that's true. Uh, Mexico had very little choice, was in a weak position, and was faced with a very, very real, uh, you know, drastic and, and continues to be faced with this drastic economic threat. And so it has had very little ability but to respond and try to cooperate. Uh, but what I'm getting at here is that while it might have some short-term, you know, immediate impacts, unfortunately, in the longer term, uh, there's a crisis of credibility of, of the president. Um, uh, there's a distrust. Uh, there's a fearing, you know, the worst now here in Mexico, even anticipating that, you know, Trump is possibly likely to be reelected. Uh, I mean, among uh, many people, there's a, a strongly held view here that somehow he's going to pull it off again. So what does that mean? Mexico is kind of stuck having to deal with this, uh, with this bully, this transactional leader. Um, that is very difficult to plan, uh, but again, Mexico is in a weak position and has well, few options uh, to maneuver. Yes, but uh, you know, I, I feel I agree with you uh, that Mexico may be in a weak position, and you know, <clears throat> governments are frail sometimes. People are frail who are in government positions, and they, um, you know, they're subject to that intimidation. But the people in the street, uh, the media, uh, the rank and file, the management, you know, uh, the, the entrepreneurs of Mexico, I'm sure, as you said, they carry away uh, less trust, less trust in Trump, less trust in, in the United States. And our relationship, therefore, is affected by what is happening. Yeah. You know, you might win short term like a demagogue, but you can't mm -hmm. fool all the people all the time. All the time. Yeah. And, and I think Absolutely. that. Absolutely. No, no. Yeah. And, and our relationship <laughs> with Mexico has been damaged is being damaged, and it's not dissimilar from our relations with so many other countries. So um, if you have no policy and you go by the rule of intimidation, uh, you wind up isolated in every way, including in global relations. That's what's happening. So uh, I agree with you that he's able to intimidate Mexico, but in the long term, uh, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So let's, let's talk about that. Um, the president of Mexico is not going to the G20. Why? Yeah, and, and there's, you know, a raging debate about that. On one hand, um, his, his take is that he's got too much work at home, domestic. His, his whole platform, he was elected about a year ago, but came to office in uh, December. So it's about six, seven months now. He, but beyond that, he's also won, um, you know, Mexico in the last 30 years has had presidents that tend to be you know, Ivy League trained, competent with English, usually, you know, technocrats and, you know, finance and business. This new leader, a populist left wing leader, doesn't speak English, is not a global traveler, uh, sold the presidential plane and fleet of the helicopters. So if he goes abroad, he's got to get on a commercial airline. Uh, but more than that, he, even yesterday, he held a press conference where he had a video conference interview with Mark Zuckerberg. You don't have to leave the country. You can do this and that. Uh, and yet, you know, the reality is that, you know, in the world of diplomacy, you need person-to-person -person real contact. You have a, a certain group dynamic, a certain... And so, and frankly, these G20 summits, they're an important forum for many countries like Mexico that are the South of Korea, the Indonesias of the world. They come together in this forum and they have uh, a seat at the table with obviously the top seven, ten, you know, economies, um, and you would think for the Mexican leader, he might find opportunity to build support from other uh, members of the G20, the Europeans, other South Americans, the Turkeys of the world, somehow, you know, rally some, uh, I don't know, some, you know, support for, for their uh, weakened position with the U.S., uh, but he's not planning to go. He's that's that's regrettable. Minister. It's regrettable, because if he establishes is, uh, relations yeah. with other countries, yeah. if he can establish alliance, he can... He can, you know, get some strength as against Trump, uh, so that Trump won't be able uh, to intimidate him it, this way. It, um, it's it, diplomacy 101, but unfortunately, he's not a student of diplomacy. He has a view that is very much, uh, you know, and, and maybe it works on some level uh, confronting Trump to ignore him, to not engage him, to obviously, you know, not go to you, visit him, and not invite him to come here. Uh, but uh, at some point, you know, we live in this globally interdependent world, and Mexico does need help. It needs to reach out. Moreover, 
So given its heavy dependence on the U.S., it, it does need to seek, uh, you know, growing partnerships in Europe and Asia, other parts of Latin America. But uh, I think uh, much to my dismay, I think uh, the president here has sort of taken the easy route out. And yeah. He's not planning to go. Uh, and that's unfortunate. I think it, it's a loss for It Mexico. is because, uh, you know, uh, the reality is Trump is the president. I, I, I have to... I have to remind myself of that every day. Uh, that's the reality. And furthermore, the reality is that Trump might win again. He might win again. I hope not, but there you have it. And finally, even if whether he wins again or doesn't win again, you still have this large base um, that, that believes in him and people like him. And we might have another president coming along that's just like Trump. So the president of Mexico, really, it's in, in the interest, his interest and the interest of Mexico to recognize those realities and try to deal with it and try to, and try to level, level the playing field so we can have, you know, yeah. a diplomatic relationship with this country uh, that, yeah. that will be stronger somehow. And that's too bad that he's not yeah. doing that. It yeah, should... yeah, it's a good opportunity. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. Let's, let's unpack some more. Uh, so, okay, Xi Jinping, he got intimidated. He's coming to the G20. He's got problems in Hong Kong. He's probably a little sensitive about the loss of his effectively absolute power over recent months and years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, yeah. he wants to. But at the same time, you see what he's doing. He's, um, he's visiting with Putin and he's visiting with, Xi, with uh, Kim Jong-un in North Korea. He's, he's building his alliances so he's ever stronger. Yeah. He's, he's pulling the rug out from under Trump in, in a way by by building his alliances in advance of the G20. Yeah. Um, but I, and I suspect, you must have some thoughts on this, I suspect that there is no agenda whatsoever on this meeting between, this big you know, drum roll meeting between uh, Trump and Xi Jinping uh, in Osaka. Uh, Trump hasn't figured it out. He has no idea what he's gonna say or do. He doesn't have a position, he never yeah. has a position. He'll just try to intimidate him and use uh, the tariffs and other things uh, uh, with, without, without the likelihood of any meaningful result, which, you know, you didn't mention in so many words, but it, all this time, you mentioned that, it, I guess, Mexico has, has uh, uh, you know, has, has allowed Trump to, to intimidate it. But all of these efforts in North Korea, uh, Russia, um, China, uh, the Middle East, what did I miss? Venezuela. Trump has failed. You know, his foreign policy has failed. A lot of talk, no action, no result. So here we are, we're going to G20. I doubt that Trump has any real no, agenda, sir. and there won't be a result. Do you agree? Well, yeah, it's pretty clear, and he made that you know, clear in his other uh, visits abroad, where he doesn't really prepare. He doesn't read the briefings. He just goes and tries to wing it. Uh, and I suppose with the ongoing trade wars, I mean, that's his game right now, to kind of push the threat of, of tariffs. Um, and with China, of course, these are the two largest economies. I mean, ultimately, uh, they've got to meet. They've got to talk face to face. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, we talked about the missed opportunity for even this Mexican leader. Uh, as much as it may be awkward, frankly, he would probably benefit from meeting Trump, shake his hand and tell him, hey, chill out or, you know, uh, let, let's, you know, let's work on some common uh, agendas, you know. Uh, and, and yet that, uh, that, that's not happening. So again, uh, like you put it, maybe, you know, there's foreign policy with no policy. Uh, I would have contrast, uh, you know, the U.S. and its lack of any real clear plan and strategy with the case of China. I mean, they, they are playing a very slow, long-term game. Uh, as you know, they have this ambitious, you know, one belt, one road initiative. So they have a lot of strategic interest with many players throughout Asia, throughout Africa, the Middle East. And so I'm quite sure Xi Jinping uh, and the Chinese leadership, very savvy at their diplomacy, they use these multilateral forms to do that, uh, to do a lot of the handshaking and then, uh, and otherwise, uh, you know, deepening the more strategic thinking that they have. Uh, we seem to be lacking it on our side. Yeah, I see two possibilities uh, uh, on, on Xi Jinping. You know, one possibility is he's building all these <laughs> other relationships. And as you say, one belt, one road uh, is, is an enormous uh, economic and, and influence project around the world, all the way to Spain. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's, he's got other fish that he's frying, and he's trying to, um, you know, do without the United States, do without Trump. Of course, that's very hard for China, because China is, in many ways, dependent. So I, I, give, you, I give you two possibilities, see what, what you think. Maybe there's a third possibility with Xi Jinping. Number one is, uh, 
it'd, it'd be the same kind of result that uh, Trump had uh, with uh, Kim Jong Un in Singapore a few months ago, where they, you know, they sit, they talk. Uh, it's all very love letter kind, uh, but nothing happens, and Xi Jinping doesn't agree to anything, and it, it, the whole the whole thing gets kicked down the road. And he feels strong enough to do that, and and Trump has really no options because he's running out of gas on on his uh, tariffs. People in this country are beginning to wonder. I mean, many people more than a, more than a few months mm -hmm. ago. The the other the other possibility. Um, is that uh, Xi Jinping gives him something nominal, something, yeah, okay, all right, we'll give you something, but it will be illusory, and uh, it, won't, yeah, it, won't yeah. be, it won't be, it won't have any meat. And so it plays into Trump's sense of theater, just like Trump is doing this largely for theater. Uh, Xi Jinping, you know, can do something largely for theater. Am I missing an option there? Yeah. Well, I think it's going to fall within that realm, but I'm more inclined to think the latter. I think the Chinese, like so many others, are learning to figure out Trump. And what does that mean? Well, you've got to praise him. You've got to give him something, you know, something that he can then turn around and claim, you know, this wouldn't have happened without me. I, I made the best deal. And yet, you know, gosh, even with that knowledge, it's so hard to predict and then to really uh, anticipate uh, that outcome. Uh, but I guess what I'm getting at here is I think the Chinese, who themselves have fears about, you know, uh, a downturn in their economy, um, it wouldn't go well with the rising, you know, middle class. And uh, and so my point is, that I think, yeah, like you suggest, they're likely to see what they can offer, some carrot, some, something to put on the table. Uh, beyond that, though, we hear we're talking about a multilateral forum. This is not a summit meeting between uh, China and the U.S., but it's an opportunity for those leaders to suddenly be on stage. And as we know from, again, uh, the, the OECD meetings, the NATO meetings, the other G7 meetings, these are not places that Trump likes to be. He prefers a rally where he can put together, you know, the image and all the, you know, the, the look. Uh, in these, you know, he, it's not about him and he's not the center of it. And that's, that's an uncomfortable position for him to be in. Yeah, Carlos, uh, that's a really interesting I, point. Because, because Trump doesn't like multilateral arrangements. But Xi Jinping and the others, the G20 is multilateral. That's what it's about, mm -hmm. to try to reach multilateral mm -hmm. agreement. So, you know, one thing that Xi Jinping can do is while he's talking unilaterally, bilaterally with Trump, he's talking multilaterally with all the other people there. At the end of the day, he reaches some kind of illusory theater kind of result with Trump, um, but, but he has a real result with you know, the other countries he's trying to lead, Southeast Asia and Central Asia and all that, all the way to Spain. And so, uh, you know, what might happen at the end of the day is, uh, you know, the possibility that Xi Jinping gives him something, gives Trump something, but, but makes a real deal with many others in the multilateral discussions. Don't you love that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. And then again, uh, he's a kind of person that he commands a lot of uh, attention and, you know, uh, to some extent, I suppose, respect because of the powerful economy that he, he goes over. And what I want to say is, by contrast, even though Trump represents the most powerful military, the biggest economy, there is a lot of unease about him when he comes in, you know, a lot of uncertainty and then maybe uh, a recognition that he just doesn't play by the traditional norms and uh, the way he does play can be quite mean-spirited and, and, and unpredictable. So. Uh, you know, he walks into a room and it's not like excitement or, or you know, maybe uh, an aura. It's more, you know, trying to see, you know, uh, what, what, what could possibly happen. Oh, oh my God, say. what's going to happen now? So let's, let's unpack some of these others. Uh, just thinking geographically, <laughs> what about <clears throat> North Korea? North Korea going to be there at G20? Uh, is there any possibility that there'll be a denouement yeah. between Trump and Kim Jong-un? No, no, they, they would not be there for one, and they, it would not be a top item uh, for uh, for the you know because you only have the interest of a handful of players there: Japan, uh, Russia, China, the U.S., and South Korea. So the players are there, but it's not going to be, I think, an agenda item uh, at the forefront. Uh, the G20 really, you know, for many years we've had uh, about 30 years the G7. It used to be the eight. These are the top industrialized countries of the world. G20 began probably around 20 years ago. And, and the first part, the first five, ten years, it was not seen as particularly relevant. It was just a bigger club, a few extra players. But really in the last decade, um, when you have the growing power and emergence of powers like India, Indonesia, Turkey, uh, et cetera, now this G20 is often seen as an important voice for these emerging powers, for the sort of mid-level developing countries. 
Um, and yet, here we are in a crisis of multilateralism, given Trump, given even the saga that continues in Europe, uh, the crisis in the European Union. So this multilateralism, I guess I'm suggesting, is kind of facing a real critical political crisis. Uh, are these forums still relevant? They're not what they used to be. And nevertheless, they, they are continue. They, they, they continue to happen every Every uh, few, every, literally every few weeks, every few months, you have one of these forums, the G20, the OECD, the APEC. Uh, many of them are overlapping players, yes. And so there are common issues and agenda items. Uh, but, uh, you know, here I, I would just go back to this. Uh, uh, we're at a moment, a critical juncture right now, where there's a crisis between the key players, Japan and China, I'm sorry, U.S. and China. Uh, Japan is also trying to kind of recarve out, and they are the host country here in Osaka. Uh, but uh, the leader there, uh, you know, Shinzo Abe, has interestingly come out now to try to almost be a, a mediator with the crisis in Iran, a role traditionally not played by uh, Japan. Uh, and so they're trying to walk this delicate balance. Uh, and then Shinzo Abe, who's had uh, probably among the world leaders, you know, one of the closer relationships with Trump, he's also been burned a little bit. And, uh, you know, it remains to be seen. Uh, are they going to have any sidebar, and, you know, and, and, and time together? Uh, we also know Trump, when he goes to these meetings, he wants to get in, you know, be the last one there and be the first one out. So, um, you know, will he use what little time he may have there to, who will he meet with? I guess that's the puddle. What about Putin? Are they going to, you know, shake hands? Are they going to have a picture together? Are they going to go off and have a meeting with no translators again or what? Uh, it'll be interesting to see a lot of, a lot of uncertainty, though. These are strange times. Chaos, as far as the world stage is concerned, and it's not any good reason for confidence by anybody. But you mentioned uh, Abe and uh, his efforts to uh, be a mediator in the uh, Iran thing. Let's, let's turn to that in terms, in terms of global diplomatic relations. Um, you know, it seems to me that uh, pulling out of the nuclear deal a year ago uh, was without any effort to try to negotiate, uh, you know, acceptable changes to that deal. He just pulled out, bingo, uh, in a punitive way. Uh, and now for the last year, he's really been unable to get any traction on meetings. And I can understand that. It's not only the Iranians, but anyone who would be offended by what he did in the beginning, not going to be so quick to meet with him. They don't intimidate easily. Uh, and I, they haven't yeah. been intimidated. They meet him at the pass on everything, including, uh, you know, building nuclear bombs. Uh, so where are we in, in terms of Iran? It sounds like, you know, you put a thousand troops in and then another thousand and you bring carriers, uh, you know, in near the borders and all that. And uh, are we going to have a, a little war here? Uh, this sounds very uh, dangerous to me. Yeah, I sure hope not. And it's, it's interesting to think 1979 is now 40 years ago since we've had a pretty, obviously, continued tense relationship with Iran. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, Trump is not one who reads the details, knows the history, understands, you know, the policy options and scenarios. So for him, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure he could find Iran on a map or, or tell you anything about uh, previous, you know, very close relations the country had before uh, the revolution in 79 with the U.S. Um, you know, uh, we, we see in the media different attention to how, well, neither side really wants conflict. But when we study war and violence, you know, many, many wars usually we're never expected to reach that point. I mean, it's a misperception of one thing or the other about the other side's intentions, about their capabilities, and often, you know, it's sparked by some mistake. So it is a very volatile, dangerous hotspot. Uh, and I think, you know, after the saga of, of Iraq, now 15, 16 years back, uh, and what played out there, there's no appetite here in the U.S. for a massive, large-scale intervention for what? What's the goal? Uh, and Iran is a very different context. It's a major regional power. And just like when we revisit, you know, the end of World War II, where we try to understand Russia and their interests, you cannot appreciate the Middle East without realizing that, like it or not, Iran is a major, major regional power. And it has, obviously, tentacles everywhere, and it will continue. Um, it's also a pretty well-educated society, a large population. Uh, and, you know, they've been suffering for decades now from this stranglehold. Uh, and, you know, I think it's Unfortunately, you know, for someone like Trump, it might be naive to think that he alone is going to bring about the change. Uh, overall, we saw from the European partners a, a real dismay with the U.S. decision to pull out because, you know, the progress was being made to ensure that, that Iran did not have the capability 
you know, to move forward with a weapons program, and that is now, you know, more up in the air, given yeah. the U.S. Uh, bellicosity. It's, it's, not, it's not only their bellicosity and uh, the weapons program, but, um, you know, they operate through agents. They foment unrest in so many places. Yeah. Uh, they're scoundrels in, in a global sense, and he can't stop them from that. Uh, you know, they could, they could do uh, hacking on our power plants. Who knows what? Um, you know, there, there seems yeah. to be a kind of truce on that. Um, but, but it could happen any time. Uh, and, yeah. and if you bring a power plant down in a given location, given region, um, people die. It's real serious. Yeah. Um, and that brings me to Russia. Uh, you know, where are we in terms of our relations with Russia? It's all, it's all clouded and, and stirred up by, yeah. by the Mueller investigation. And the fact that, yes, they did, in fact, mess around in our elections last time and are probably doing the same thing this time. Uh, and we'll definitely do it in November 2020. Um, where, where can our diplomatic relations be? I don't think he's helped. Do you think he's done anything to help? Does, does, has he done anything to hurt? What's your thought about that? Yeah, in some ways, you know, given all these other scenarios we've just talked about, whether North Korea, Iran, even Mexico, Russia has kind of been pushed back into the, you know, sort of the third, fourth tier. Uh, but uh, overall, because of, again, the, the transactional nature of the, of the relationship and uh, maybe Trump's bromance or affinity for Russia, uh, it's more about that relationship. And uh, at this point, we haven't seen much interaction uh, between them. Uh, and uh, again, this, it'll be interesting to see, will there be anything happening at this upcoming uh, G20 meeting? Uh, but you also can't help but get a sense that the Russians are probably a little disappointed or, or tired or maybe frustrated by, you know, the U.S. and its, uh, you know, its current regime. Because uh, on one hand, if, you know, if, if, they, if it is the case that they help to elect him, I'm not sure that he's delivered to them any good that has he given, you know, Russia a more prestige in the world? Has he given Putin anything concretely? Uh, and, and then, you know, if you have to if you go from that, you know, this upcoming election, what is in the interest of Russia? On one hand, you know, one can say they have an interest in destabilizing the U.S., creating conflicts. They had possibly got a, uh, Trump elected, and, and that, you know, was seen as maybe an alternative to uh, a harder line policy that would have come from a victory by Clinton. Uh, but what about the future? I mean, what, there's no clear choice or option right now. But I guess I just can't help but think that Putin and the Russians are probably a little dismayed with, with Trump. What did I read in just this morning's <clears throat> paper that the Russians were, were, were tired of their efforts at trying to influence things in Venezuela. <clears throat> and they're, they're softening their position there, and I, they're just getting fatigued like the rest of us. Anyway, Carlos, it's great to talk to you. It opens so many new thoughts and doors. Uh, Carlos Juarez in the International Relations Department of the University of the Americas in Puebla, Mexico. We always enjoy talking with you. Look, look forward to the next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jay. Aloha. Take Aloha. care.